it's because my notes are on here. <laughs> um, but I'll probably ignore them and waffle, so just ignore me. So I'm Amanda, I'm, I work for Dig Ventures, and I've done for a while now. And I'm going to talk about how the COVID and the pandemic and our response within that time frame has actually had an ongoing kind of impact on the business and, and how it's changed what we do a little bit. But before we start, in case you don't know who Dig Ventures are, it actually set up about 10 years ago now. It's our 10th year um, by two archaeologists with a dog <laughs> who was called Fergus, who since died, it's very sad. Um, but it was all about actually looking at how you can do archaeology and how you can fund archaeology in different ways. Um, it specialised very much in crowd participation, either as a community excavation, getting people involved, um, but also through raising income through crowdfunding and getting people involved through crowdsourcing. So actually that participation element was really key and has been since the beginning. Um, the, the experiment started at Flag Fen. That was the first excavation that was run through the project that raised um, 25,000, I think, as income. And that involved people paying to dig to come onto the site, as well as paying digitally to support the excavations as well. So people were kind of putting forward contributions to just be part of what was happening. And the, su the success of that then obviously has, has just grown and moved on, and that's part of our model. Um, it's, it's a really interesting story. It's something that Brendan Wilkins, who was one of the co-founders, has done a PhD about. You can read about it all over the place. And he will talk to you at length if you ask him about business models <laughs> and economics. So I'm not going to go into it in great detail today. Um, but what I wanted to do is look at that challenge that the pandemic threw down to an organisation that was already very digital, already very communicative, very participatory, um, and actually how we had to respond to it even in that position as well, and, and what kind of changed to our kind of normal business. But before I go into that, I'm going to talk a little bit about what that normal business looked like. So over the years, we've raised about £2 million in crowdfunding plus matched funding. And the important thing to note there is Dig Ventures is not just about people paying to dig. Uh, we use that as matched funding for grants. We run tendered projects as well. Like any other business, we even dip our toes into the commercial world occasionally and do evaluations <laughs> and watching briefs. Um, and you have to have that kind of mixed income stream in order to survive as a business, really, in archaeology. Um, we've run about 45 excavation projects. Many of our projects are multi-year staged projects. So actually, the, um, some of our longest running projects are kind of six, seven years. that We'll kind of do almost small evaluation trenches year on year and kind of find out more about a site. Each year we see about a thousand dig participants, so that's people coming to join us from a day, but they might be with us for two weeks. And that has this blended model of either crowdfunding excavations, where those people joining us have paid to join us, or if it's through projects as part of landscape partnership schemes, obviously all of that is free participation. Um, and it just depends on the model that's being run. We see about a million social media engagements as well, so we're very active on social media and we talk a lot about what we're doing, so you might already be bored by the images. <laughs> uh, but if you're somebody that engages with Twitter and Instagram and archaeology, you've probably seen us pop up here and there through the, uh, through the years. What you'll see in the background here is uh, our excavations at Lindisfarne, so you can see the trenches down here just next to the Priory, and that's one of our really flagship projects that we've been running now. We're about to enter our sixth year, I think, this year. And this is really what a Dig Ventures project looks like. Um, this, is, this is where we are today, but this would be similar kind of pre-COVID. So we run campaigns. We launch campaigns in December time. We tell people about what we've done. We tell people what we're going to do. We invite people to join us. And it has this kind of blended model. Lindisfarne is the only project we have that's effectively 100% crowdfunded. Um, and this is something that works in partnership with the uh, University of Durham. Dr. David Petz is a co-director of the site and has been there from the beginning and, in fact, invited us and uh, courted us to come and join uh, and help run that excavation. So it's also a student field school training excavation. Um, but you can see, so this is this year's campaign. We're digging from the middle of September. We've already kind of gone past the budget. The, the dig dates are sold out, if that makes sense. But that's a blend of both excavation participants, again, as I say, from a day to two weeks sometimes. But that also includes people spending 
uh, finds days with us. So people that aren't necessarily going to participate in the excavations will come and join us in the finds room. We're really well resourced up in Linda's Farm. We've got access to the village hall. We're able to use that. We're kind of part of the community in the summer now. There's also a great pub, which helps <laughs> when you're stuck on the island and the tides come in. Um, and we also run dig camps and dig clubs as well. So we try and accommodate families. We try and accommodate kids. But we recognise the kind of health and safety risks of, risks of that. So um, you can't join us into the trenches unless you're over a certain age. But we do have those kind of moments where families can come and join us with very young children as well, as long as they don't just drop them off and then go to the pub themselves. Um, but it's very popular and it, and it has this kind of engaged community. We very much have an audience of people that come along and join us. Um, and going into the pandemic, they were kind of there with us from the start. The reason that we keep people engaged or the, the kind of the cart and the horse side of it is we're very digital and that includes our site archive. So context records, finds records, photo registers, sample registers, all of the stuff that all archaeological teams do, we do it all online and make it visible. We add to it and we enrich that data through the project and we make sure that as far as possible we keep it up to date. Um, but we also take photos of finds as they're recovered on site. So it's, as you can see here, it's just the find on people's hands. And that's the same with the context records as well. You know, they're, they're not the neat archive photos, but it means that those who have helped support the project from home can actually see what they've supported as it's being done. It means the people that join us on the site can share their own finds and the context they've recorded with their friends and families. Um, and it means that our specialist team can see what's going on <laughs> before they get a box of fines in the post uh, and a deadline. Um, the participants are very much part of the team and that's been a really important kind of way of working with a community. Crowdfunding is not about money, it's about audiences and it's about building a community of people that you work with all the way through. Um, and that's supported by our participants having their own profile, Within that profile, it will show what finds they've found from different sites, what courses they might have done with us, and it really helps them kind of feel part of something as well. So we've kind of built a platform that pulls all of those different elements together. Going into COVID, I would say we were very much about tech-enabled archaeology from the kind of participation side. So we knew how to do websites and we knew how to work digital, but we were very much doing that in support of the excavation. It was about digging and getting people with us to join us, anyone making archaeology accessible to them. What happened during COVID was trying to do that, but with everybody sitting at home, <laughs> which was a different proposition. And even from the perspective of a team, it was very digital and very, uh, we already had all the equipment and we already had all the platform and, and everything else. We still had to really think about how that, um, going to catch up with myself, how that actually needed to be slightly shifted to accommodate those people who were planning to come on digs with us. We had a sold out dig season <laughs> ahead of us. Um, that th those 1,000 people that were going to come and join us in a dig were now sitting, locked in as we all were, only able to go out for an hour a day, <laughs> whatever we were all doing um, around the world. And we wanted to find a way to to keep them involved and from a business proposition we knew that the pandemic was also going to end we didn't want to lose that community and just kind of say oh well sorry we can't do it we're all we're all off now and we, we can't do anything you know we had to keep that conversation going we had to find ways to make that um to keep that interest alive and also we had a community of people that really loved archaeology and weren't able to go and do it and we weren't able to go and do it either so it was it was a useful way to kind of think about how could we actually um, kind of reuse recycle upcycle some of the content we already had but what could we create to kind of make up for the fact that we weren't going to be on site uh, and what we kind of came up with was something that we could do that used some of the tools that we already had and something that we could do that would create new content and create new ideas and, and maybe engage new audiences. Um, it was positioned very much as an experiment and it didn't become a project with a name until we were kind of halfway through and realised what we were doing. <laughs> um, we had to run this, so our field team were already furloughed. We retained a small group of, um, I think, five in total through the whole pandemic um, and they were very much on the kind of community end. And I think that's really what highlights 
where we kind of differed maybe from some other organisations going into the pandemic is we already had a staff who were the community managers who were there purely to kind of use the community and service the community through digital project um, content. And I think that idea is something that runs the way through. We call our digital content the fifth trench and we resource it, we plan it just the same as we would wheelbarrows, buckets, <laughs> tea bags, <laughs> that sort of thing. Who's on site? Who's going to be doing the digital content? That's always been part of what we do. Um, that shift, though, in terms of the what became the Archaeology at Home project, we looked at what could we do. So where we were able to, to be in the field, so later in the pandemic, is there stuff that we can do to bring people on site with us digitally? Um, what do we have already that we can run as a pure digital engagement to just kind of give people access to a bit more archaeology from home? And what do we have planned that we can kind of pivot to a purely online focus? Um, what ended up happening over the following kind of 12 to 18 months uh, engaged about 11,200 people in total. And because we already had an evaluation methodology and structure, we were able to actually evaluate the whole process, which has given us an amazing resource of information and data. Now, that evaluation uses a theory of change. We have um, a standards of evidence framework, which we use across all of our projects. And we just had to upscale it, basically. Will it work for this number of people? That, and, and the same, actually, with some of the platform um, elements that we had. Does it work with more than the usual kind of 100, 200 people involved? What happens when you get thousands of people joining you to do something. So the first thing we did, so we already had our How to Do Archaeology. This is a six-week course. Um, it takes you from the kind of the pre-planning, what do you do, how do you know where archaeology is, geophysics, desk-based assessments, those sorts of things, all the way through to what you do with your archive at the end of the day. It's very much about how to do archaeology. It's not about the sites, it's not about the finds, it's about what we do as archaeologists, but for an audience of um, non-specialists, essentially. Um, we'd run the course a few times. It's been live since 2018, I think. But often the cohorts would be 20 people. They were, it was a charge for course as well. I think we charged £29 for people to join us, so it's kind of a low cost. But that just recognised the kind of the ongoing mentoring discussion chats. We, we ran it through uh, our own virtual learning platform, and we used Facebook as a kind of a private space for people to have open discussions and you get that kind of peer-to-peer -peer contact but it meant the team could, could just jump in and answer questions um, and that's how it used to run when we actually put it through uh, when we entered the pandemic there was i think there was due to be a course running in july or something um, we had 20 people signed up for and we decided well let's just throw the doors open and see what happens so we offered it for free for anybody to do and we ran it as two cohorts because we wanted to have that sense of everybody learning together and um, we used exactly the same Facebook uh, platform and we used the same course materials the things that we added in were more to do with ethics because what we were worried about was all of a sudden if you've got a lot of people doing something people will start digging holes <laughs> people will start doing stuff and we had to put that kind of um, you know, this is the checklist that you have to do before you want to do something. If you've got your own garden and you want to dig a test bit, that's fine. So we also developed kind of materials around those specific incidences. If people really did want to dig a test bit in guard, their own gardens, that there was no reason for them not to do that, which is different depending on which country in the world you happen to live in. It gets very complicated. Um, we wanted to enable people to do that with that support. So we had that Facebook group still going where staff would jump in and answer questions. In the first session, we got 4,000 people signed up. So we went from 20 <laughs> to 4,000 overnight, which was incredible. In the second cohort, we got about the same number. And then we also amended the content. We did how to do archaeology for kids. Um, we got one of our... We'd actually collected some of the content for this um, with some kind of unplanned foresight that we might need it one day because we had a, a really super young archaeologist that has been coming on our digs for years and years and she was really interested in why we were recording and why we were doing these kind of step-by-step um, -step guides to doing stuff. And, and she wanted to have a go, so we were just like, fine, you can do that. Um, so that's what we did. So we got, in total, about uh, 8,000 people from 80 countries across the world to join us for that. We had 2,000 kids on the How to Do Archaeology course. 
with their parents, and they come from around 11 countries. Um, we collected all this data, all of these red dots shows you where they are, and you can see the, the more green, the lower the numbers, the more yellow, the higher the numbers, but a good distribution. We've never quite cracked Greenland or Iceland. <laughs> I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> we'll get there one day. Um, and we've got all of this great data, and, and what it tells us is we're, we're kind of pushing out, we're, we're getting a, a wider range of age groups, for example. We're getting quite a good representation of different socioeconomic groups. Um, um, and this is because everybody was at home <laughs> furloughed, so we weren't just restricted to those people who had that time to be able to come and join us. <coughs> um, and also, it, we could see the impact. So the people that joined us, knew a most of them knew a little bit about archaeology. Some of them had never done any archaeology before. And afterwards, um, we had a strong recommendation that people would tell their friends to do this course if they wanted to learn about archaeology. Now, that's really valuable for us to collect that sort of data. And on this scale, it's amazing. Um, we had a Dignation Festival planned for the summer. That was going to be an in-person event linked to one of our excavations at Sudley Castle. We couldn't do that. Um, so instead, we put a call out on Twitter and said, did anybody have a dig that they really wanted to do that they want to tell some people about online? <laughs> and again, we got a really good response to that. So we ended up with, um, let me see, I've got some numbers, 34 presentations represented 26 countries. And it was just people talking about the sites that they wanted to do. We had um, hominin Neanderthal crossovers in Bulgaria, Belgian battlefield archaeology, Stone Age sites in Finnish Lapland. I even did something about Dig Digital. So there was something for everybody on there. And it also um, used, again, the same platform we already had. We just repurposed it, slightly redesigned it. Um, this is kind of what happened there. Again, we've got a great participation, 3,300 participants from 61 countries, 42,000 page views over the weekend, and about 550 audience comments. So we had that kind of live commenting with the paper authors able to contribute to that. So the impact on us is we rolled it all, all that together as a project. It became very clear that this was something that was a project in itself. Um, we put ourselves forward for Europa Nostra and we managed to win that one and the Heritage in Motion Innovation Prizes. And these kind of awards across on a European stage were really important for us. I mean, we're a kind of a small business <laughs> doing stuff online. But actually having that platform and being able to speak um, in those sorts of audience was, was really helpful. So as an impact success, it was always useful. We've got 11,000 um, elements of evaluation data that we can compare to how um, the, that digital content compares to our in-person evaluation data as well. Um, we've got lots of people asking us for more, and a high proportion of the audiences there had never come to archaeology before. So that 30% of people were new to us, as well as being new to archaeology, and they've stayed with us. 89% um, stated they were now more likely to get involved. So these sorts of engagements that individual organisations have do have a bigger impact as well, because people will look for opportunities um, locally. So what happened next? Because of the, just the success and the interest in people wanting to get involved, wanting to learn, but what we found out when we ran that How to Do Archaeology course is people really want to put that knowledge into action, either by going down rabbit holes, often on the National Library of Scotland mapping site and doing their own map regression and then telling you about it and wanting some feedback, or by digging holes in their garden. Um, but we thought, we've actually, this course has run, the platform works fine, we've got you know, 4,000 people at a time working on the platform, it hasn't broken, that was a, that was a win. Um, but we've got this huge interest of people that really want to do something. So we ran deep time. So this was basically a community LIDAR mapping project with a little bit of um, artificial intelligence thrown in for fun um, with Iris Kramer, who's talking in another session later. I recommend you go and listen to that. We ran exactly the same kind of idea. We had a learning platform with loads of resources. We took people through um, how you look at maps, how you recognise archaeology in LIDAR, how you then um, draw polygons around it, how you add metadata to the records, why that's important and why that data is important. And then the AI, really, what we wanted to understand from an experimental point of view was can collective intelligence, so the community of trained citizen scientists who are now looking 
at this data? Can they help artificial intelligence learn about how you see archaeology? Um, and that was the nub of the experiment. What we found out is that citizen scientists are awesome. <laughs> like, once you tell people what to do, they will really go for it. This is our project area. We worked with the Brightwater Landscape Project. We were already working with them doing um, traditional archaeology projects. And we just said, hey, they've got cracking LIDAR data. You've got really good HER data. Can we run this experiment using that? Um, and they said, yes, that's fine. So that was great. Each of these squares is owned by one of our citizen scientists. They looked at the LIDAR data, they looked at the HER data, they mapped what they saw, they added metadata. So they both found new sites, they found about 3,000 new sites, my time's up. They found about 3,000 new sites, um, they enriched another 2,000, so they added polygons into points, they added metadata into HER data that wasn't complete, um, and it was an overall success. So this is what you see. Um, pastronaut, so they were called pastronauts, it was a great name, we had to use it. Uh, <laughs> pastronaut polygrams, and then matching the HER data. So you can see the difference between the two, how much more data the community has added into that record. Um, what we did find, all this a number, 60% uplift from positively identified archaeology. Um, and again, we asked the same questions. Your interest in archaeology has increased. Yes, it has, 46% has. Um, and then what was really interesting here as well is that sense of connection to a place. So did you, were you interested in this place? Well, not really. I just like the sound of the project. By the end of the project, they were really invested in this corner of County Durham and they wanted to know more about it. And that has a really interesting idea. These, these are people from all over the world that have never visited this area. What they've looked at is LIDAR data and maps. And now they feel really invested in the heritage of that place and hopefully have an interest in visiting in the future. So, in short, we will never be the same again. What we've done that's really had an impact on how the business runs, or I suppose the point to this, is we offered all of this content for free. So we, we did all of this for free. Everybody just joined the courses, came to the Dignation Festival. We met loads of new people. We put a tip jar at the end of the course just to see, because some people were getting in touch with us saying, oh, I'd like to pay for this anyway, and we didn't really have capacity to do that because it was free. <laughs> so we put a tip jar in. Um, because, we, you know, we need to raise income as well, just like everybody else. That's now become a subscription model, which now supports a role in itself. Um, but obviously, it needs that role to support it, because this sort of content and this sort of level of communication needs time, it needs planning, it needs management, and it doesn't just happen overnight. Um, so, yes, we were born digital, we've been doing it since 2012, and it's really made us... Um, COVID has accelerated what we do and we've ended up in a different place and that's the conclusion, I think, of this talk.